So uh, almost four years ago, I was uh, in my inner city neighborhood in Atlanta, and we were walking. Uh, we were actually invited by our friend Dorothy O'Connor to go down the street to her uh, to her shed in the backyard where she has a tableau vivant. And uh, what she would do is create these living installations where folks would step into them, and it would be all sorts of folks. There were uh, there were um, artist guild, uh, Atlanta photography guild folks. There were our neighbors who were on uh, public subsidies and food stamps, and there I was sitting with my daughter, looking into this other world that somebody had created, this benevolent thing just open for anybody to walk into. And I thought about the various ways beauty has done that in my life, drawn me, pulled me in to other things. Uh, John O'Donohue would call it love's invisible embrace, right? And I thought of the way that I've been pulled into seminary, into relationships, into this conversation, into, uh, into creating things like books and songs and all sorts of stuff. And it, it led me to a place where uh, I noticed the comparison between being drawn and being driven. Here in Neighbors Abbey was a church we formed in Atlanta where we created an installation, actually uh, um, Ash Wednesday ritual at the uh, corner of the four um, subway stations in Atlanta. And there in the Marta subway, we brought folks into this place of beauty so that it would kind of get you into, drawn into this space. And there's something that I learned when working with artists and these inner city activists, and that is in the crazy whirlwind of life, in this liminal place, Art and beauty does something, it kind of, it, it, you lean into the resonance of everything, if you will, um, when symbols no longer work. And it got me thinking. I, uh, I started learning from design science and seeing how design thinking and spiritual formation are kind of similar. Spiritual formation, we're worried about how we're forming one another, how we're forming communities, how we're forming the world around us. Design thinking saying, it's not just what you make, but how you make it. And in this integration, I started thinking, well, what is it that drives me? What is it that's pulling me in? And why is it that I think of God not having this problem? So I started thinking, is there a design problem that God's been working on? Is there a design science or a process, if you will? And I started thinking through these various processes. You have to read the book to see all six of them. It's okay. Um, but uh, but the, 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 the fun of it is that when you think of how God is going through this work as a creator... Um, how are we also in that work? So the first step of this, and I, I want to run through this with you a little bit and just let you think of a project that you've been working on. And it begins somewhere at this dream place, right? Um, design science is uh, Buckminster Fuller, the, in, the inventor of the geodesic dome, would say, if I want folks to cross this river, I'm going to build a bridge. They'll see the bridge and they'll decide to go over it. Well, what is it that God has done at this dreaming stage? Bringing into the world the future for which God has an appetite. What is it about our lives where we stop and dream. Well, then at a certain point, when you've dreamt about something, you have to step back. In design sciences, this is often called the incubation period, right? So, uh, so where has the Spirit of God stepped back, hovering over the waters? Almost like a, put a halo on anybody in this room, any experience, like over King David, when, when uh, Samuel was there going, uh, that's the one, right? The Spirit of God coming over Mary. Um, the Spirit of God descending like a dove, the Spirit of God like a flame among all of us. And it's in that place of hovering that you let go of your control of it for a second. See, drawnness and drivenness, they're kind of two different things, right? At a certain point, you want to be pulled into something, but then when you grab it, you want to make it happen so badly. And we're good here about that next step, right, of risk, places where we want to leap out and try something. But if you step back first and hover and go, what is it I'm going to try? Like this, is, this is part of that process, right? So you're dreaming, you're hovering, and then you're at a place where you leap out and take a risk. My friend Fred Wise is a painter in Atlanta, and one time I walked into his studio, and there were just marks all over the, the, the canvas, and it was, it was kind of puzzling. I, I was like, what are, you, what are you working on here? And he said, you know, I don't know yet. And has it ever occurred to you that some of the projects we might start, we won't know how they're going to end yet? So risk is an interesting thing. For Presbyterians, it means getting out of the planning stage. Um, for, for the emergent types, it means getting through the prototype and saying, maybe the shelf life is up and what's the next thing we're going to jump into? And then at a, person, at a certain point, you have to stop and look at the patterns and you have to listen. You have to listen to how they're connected. One of the best stories I've heard about this was an interview with Dan Rather and Mother Teresa. And uh, after walking through the streets of Calcutta with her, he, uh, he asked her and sat down and said, when you pray, 
you know, so everybody's listening. What is it that you say to God? And she said, nothing. I just listen. So then he goes, uh, well, what does God say? And she says, uh, he just listens too. <laughs> So there's something about the creative process where we're grabbing it, we want to control it, and then we have to stop and listen to the others around us and how the pieces fit. And this is uh, often this, uh, the articulation period in design science, right? It's this place where you're figuring out this thing I've made, how's it going to fit with the other pieces? A lot of your churches are working on experiments. And how do these experiments fit with the world in which they're situated? How does this affect your neighbor? How does this affect your family? And at a certain point, how does winning and it being successful affect you? And can you let go a little bit? At a certain point, just realize it belongs to the wider thing that is being created. You see, the sense of being God's commissioned artist and being artifacts that God is making, it's a peaceful, good story. It's good news. Because it ends with this place of rest. Jesus will say, my burden's light. Or as Peterson will put it, are you tired, worn out, burn, on, burn out on religion? Come with me and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. It occurred to me that it's kind of like a flywheel. There's something that just kind of starts. And you have to lean into it. And sometimes you have to do your damnedest to keep spinning. And sometimes you have to put down the brush and the pen and the sermon and the strategic planning and watch what happens. And when you're sleeping and resting, dreams come back. And so these cycles continue. So my encouragement to you is to think of the various ways that you're being drawn. And to make your life a monastery. To actually create these patterns like a good artist would in a studio. Or like in spiritual formation or as a design scientist. How do you go through those rhythms? Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you.